Okay, so uh, this talk is based on a chapter in a book of mine, which is about to come out with Oxford. The book is called Biological Essentialism. And this is the last chapter. And that's why the handout has all these sections labeled six and the six point this and some of the other. <clears throat> okay. Hi, 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 good, good. So, um, so let me get on with it. There's um, rather a lot more in the chapter than I have any, any hope of getting to. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is give you the high points, um, sometimes without the argument, and sometimes, and certainly not for the most part, but uh, addressing objections. You can have a see what the objections are, from the handout, because the handout um, has a lot of things in it which I will be skipping. So let's start then um, with a quote from John Dupre, eminent philosopher of biology. Quote, recent biology has confirmed the conviction of those who have long insisted that racial kinds were social kinds and undermined any possible argument for placing these kinds in the realm of the biological. In its broadest and most common understanding, the concept of race remains little more than the reified residue of race. Well, I'm going to argue, contrary to John, I'm going to argue that there are racial kinds in the realm of biology, differing in minor ways and with essences that are partly historical and partly underlying interest. Now, I'm not, if not uh, keep your eye on the handout because the, the, the high points are in, in the handout. I'm not denying that there are racial kinds in some sense that are not biological kinds. John gives, John Dupre gives a very nice example, which I will quote. In the UK, People are classified as black if they're non-white and hence experience discrimination. It includes people with Asian origins, as well as those of African and Afro-Caribbean descent, will also include, no doubt, a very small number of native Australians or New Zealanders. Well, I'm not, as I see arguing that there aren't races of social kinds in some sense. I'm actually inclined to think however, that there aren't. I'm inclined to think that examples like uh, the UK blacks are really examples of failed biology constructs rather than social ones. But I'm not going to be arguing. I'm not happy to talk about it. Some of them to talk about it. Okay. Uh, it seems to me the, the issue of this is what got me in, in, engaged with race, race, racial realism. The, it, the issue is unclear. And I hope to clarify it. And the particular thing I hope to do here to clarify it is to emphasize a distinction that has run through my book, The Priorities, between taxon and taxile and cat. The distinction will become, I hope, very clear in a few minutes. And uh, the second thing I want to do, that I really will only gesture at it today, uh, I want to reject what is common in the debate among philosophers of race. It's common to have to talk about meaning. I think philosophers find talking about meaning irresistible. Um, I, I think all, nearly all of us would say. Uh, except for those who talk about meaning, whose business is meaning. Uh, for everyone else, I can give you where it lies to leave it alone. But I, I will just do that. So that's a feature of my, 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 my the chapter. I think it's, a, I think this continual fuss about the meaning of hope, the old meaning of the ordinary word basis is a distraction from, and not a real theoretical interest. Um, Race realism is not a theory of race. So it's not a pernicious theory of race. It's not a racist theory. It's not a theory of race at all in, the, in many of those interesting terms. Now, left to myself, I preferred the term 
race realism for the doctrine that I'm going to be defending. But it was pointed out to me by Keishon Spencer, a, a leading philosopher of race. Keishon pointed out to me that race realism is the name that the white nationalists and other such nationalists like to use for their realism. And so because of that, philosophers of race, not wanting to give comfort to, right, white, to the white nationalists and wanting to distance themselves from white nationalists, not surprisingly, have preferred the term racial realism. And that's why it seems to me stylistically not as good, but for sound political reasons, we should avoid race realism. Okay, um, so look, I'm on to 6.2 and a presentation on the issue. This comes from Keishon Spencer, who I just mentioned. I quote, it's on the hand there. In Joshua Glasgow's influential book, A Theory of Race, he clearly and succinctly defines racial realism as the view that race is real, where something is real just in case it exists. Racial realism might seem to be trivially true. For example, it's widely accepted in the natural sciences that if you can show that even one member of a kind exists, then that kind exists. For instance, that is the strategy of chemists, the strategy chemists use to identify new elements. And it's the strategy that biologists use to identify new species. Given this assumption, and given that, say, Asians, Blacks, Native Americans, and whites are paradigms of races in the current American English, is not it trivially true that race itself exists? Well, it's, it's not that simple. And indeed, it's not that simple. But it, the issue, in my view, is not well pre presented as being about whether race is real or exists. There are similar issues about Linnaean, Linnaean hierarchy. So here we're talking species on up. There are similar issues there where there's talk of existence and real and, yet and real, which also seems to me mistaken, and I've argued about this before, and I will be, uh, I'll be coming back to, I will be continually comparing the issues to do with race, with um, other biological taxa. On to 6.3. Okay, I mentioned this distinction between taxon and category. This is really, uh, I make a, a, a lot of this throughout my chapter, indeed divide the discussion up in, the, in this way. So what is this distinction? It's just, it's a very intuitively clear distinction. It was introduced, uh, it, well, probably not introduced, but it was certainly identified and emphasized by the, uh, famous biologist Ernst Meyer. And the distinction is, um, uh, well, let's take, well, let, I'll read what I've seen, and then I'll give you, I'll fill it, fill it out a bit. Um, dogs are a taxa, fraud, and we've got to distinguish that from the category, species, which dogs are supposed to be in, as an example. Pacific Island, then we move to, to Pacific Islands, are a taxon, a taxon. We should distinguish that from the category race. What we're distinguishing here is issues about kinds from issues about kinds of kinds. I want to say a bit more so that this is done. Let's take, I mentioned dogs. There are dogs. There are, there are, in, there, are, that's not, there are wolves, there are coyotes. All of these are taxa. So also is canis. Canis is a taxon that includes the ones I've just mentioned and various others. And there's a taxon above that, can, can he die? Which includes canis and others. They are all taxa. But then there's the issue. What kind of taxa 
common to think, though not universally thought, that dogs, Canis familiaris, this is our, our species. It's, everyone agrees that wolves, Canis lupus, are a species. Some people think Canis familiaris is a subspecies of wolves. Perhaps that's a minority view. But then let's take the dingo, because there you get, no, everyone knows there are dingoes, right? They're out below wild things. Uh, so no controversy about that. What about, the, that's a taxon, is it? The taxon. And we can argue about the taxon, and what and its nature and so on, taxon. I know you're relating to this. And so there are lots of issues we can raise about dogs or canids or, or, or dingoes. But now what about the category? What category does dingo come? It's a nice example for me to give to you because there's a lot of argument about that. Uh, the taxonomists, there are four different answers you find among the taxonomists. He said, here are the two extremes. One extreme is dingoes are a species of canis. Another extreme is they just talk. Perhaps a good bit of it. And in between, you've got the view that Canis is a subspecies of Canis familiaris, and the view that it's a subspecies of Canis lupus. So here you've got a whole lot of argument about what kind of kind dingoes are. And that's a very different issue from any issue about any of the tax range. Right? I hope that distinction is vivid in everyone's mind. Um, perhaps I hope I haven't bored you by going on there. Um, okay, so moving on, I will from time to time be referring to the snakes. I, 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 I needed a nice example, and I've been using them all through the book. Um, and I'll just mention there are, there are the California, on the Californian around San Francisco, there, are, there is a Gaza snake, and uh, it has, it's generally regarded to be. Uh, to be a species with two subspecies, a peninsula garfa snake and a coastal garfa snake. And they have nice fancy Latin names, of course. Um, but I'm not going to argue, in the paper I argue this, but I'm not going to argue it. I'm just going to say the issue that concerns us here, this really, is not about the existence of any. That is a misleading way of presenting it. The realism issue is not, should not be thought of in that way. What is the issue? Well, what I argue, and I'm just going to present you as my conclusion, it's on the handout. The issue is whether these kinds, all kinds of kinds, are appropriately special. Do they carve nature at its joint? These are lovely metaphors. Whether, now I'm getting to non, non metaphorical whether it is partly because an entity is of that kind that it has the characteristics and behavior that it has. Putting this another way, is the kind genuinely explanatory in biology? That's the issue, which I argue is not I have to argue here today. All right, so that gives me my, the theses I wish to argue for. And they're on the handout. The first is racial taxonomism. There are intraspecific kinds. Intraspecific, of course, means kinds below the level of the species. There are intraspecific kinds thought to be racist. It's important here. I'm not claiming they are racist because that would be begging the question on the category issue. There are intraspecific kinds thought to be racist that are biologically explanatory. Applied that. To humans, where of course a lot of the race excitement is, racial, you get racial tax on realism. Humans, there are intraspecific kinds of humans thought to be races that are biologically. And the racial, and then we get to the category issue, racial category realism. There are intraspecific kinds that form a biologically explanatory category of race. So notice the issue all the time is what is biological. That's what the realism issue is. Okay, so now I get to the argument for um, racial tax on realism, not category, 
Um, early on in the book, I've implicitly accepted realism for subspecies. Uh, um, I mentioned my snakes. There's the there's one of the subspecies of the snake, the California snake. Uh, you'd expect, uh, by the way, these, these snakes, the coastal and the peninsula, same species, but they differ quite strikingly. Um, now, a priori, you'd expect that there would be lots of lesser differences which biologists find explanatory interesting to make them into that we can sort things of the time. Lesser differences than there are between subspecies. And that's exactly what we find. I quote from the handout from Templeton. Templeton is a leading biologist. If evolutionary biologists have many words for subdivision within a species. And then here's at the lowest level are deems. Now, I produce a whole lot of examples from the literature of the use of the classification of subspecific taxa. And there's a variety of terms used, including variety. So that, that's particularly used in biology, in botany. Other others, forms, sub varieties, sub forms, ecotypes, form our specialities, very fancy Latin term for a sub specific terms in species, and the term strain. So there's this range of them. And everyone will, for the purpose of the talk, what we want to know is are any of them thought to be racist? Is race, in fact, one of the terms that gets banded around here, along with those other? And the answer is definitely yes. As I say on the handout, you'll find you'll, I've got a whole lot of quotes I'm going to give you, and quotes from a range of things. Biologists often apply the term race in now. Informally and a bit loosely. The inform is getting at the fact that the, the bodies that control taxonomy have sort of have very firm views about what gets uh, taxonomized at the using these sorts of names at the ranks species are much less firm below. So there's a lot of loosey goosey stuff. Biologists to talk in several different ways. Um, an example which I, I like, uh, because I, it came with a picture, there are four races, that's actually what they call them, of, of, of a well known moss. It's called Fus comatrella patens. That's the name of the species. It's a quite an important species of moss, and that's what, there are four races. The idea that biological races are the same as ecotypes has quite a lot of popularity. Also, surprisingly to me, the idea that, among philosophers of biology, the idea that um, races should be identified as subspecies. That's just to keep in mind as we go on. Here I sum up, middle of page two. It's very clear that phenotypic, genotypic, and historical differences between inbreeding, in, in, intra breeding groups of members of a species have led biologists to posit many intra specific taxa at a few levels in an intra specific hierarchy. And race is among the names that biologists use informally and a bit loosely for some of these groups. We can extract one way, though certainly not the only way, that biologists place race in the hierarchy. I see it as a bit loose. This seems to me to be the most common way of thinking of race 
And there you see the hierarchy. The, the top of the hierarchy, that is the one, the level below species, um, is uh, subspecies. And then you get varieties, forms, and control. So a race, and at the bottom, themes and strengths. And my claim is, based on what's going on in the market, these intraspecific taxa serve both structural and historical explanatory purposes. So, racial attacks on real humans really true. What are the natures? Moving on. So that's the, the real thing. What about what's the nat what are the natures of these sub intraspecific uh, taxa? Or as I prefer to say, what are their essences? In my view, just like the higher taxa species are, the ones that are thought to be in the Linnaean hierarchy, these taxa, intraspecific taxa, have part intrinsic and part historical nature essences. And I claim that this is implicit in biological that is what people are implicitly doing when they pick out taxa is they're picking out something which has a certain sort of history and a certain sort of underlying intrinsic nature. It's natural to think it's proper to think the underlying intrinsic nature is at the level of the genes. But you've got to be very careful. This essentialism that I just claimed is highly plausible. I say that. Because it's rejected by just about all philosophers of biology. <laughs> and I wish some of my friends who reject it again, perhaps some of you will reject it. Anyway, why is it highly plausible? Okay, well, here's, here's a, here it is in a nutshell. Of course, the book has massive, <laughs> a lot of books about this. Some underlying intrinsic property at the genetic level, together with the environment, with, think about an individual, right? Some underlying intrinsic property or genetic level together with the environment explains the phenotypic properties of an individual. That surely is undeniable. In putting it in that familiar, almost folk way, it's the nature nurture business. It's got to be a matter of the nature and the nurture. So that should be undeniable. We're thinking about an individual. Right? Well, the essentialist hypothesis is that the very same underlying problem explains these phenotypic problems and other members of her race. What's the alternative to that? Since we have these same phenotypic problems, what's the, other, what's the alternative? Well, certainly not, but there's a large variety of underlying causes. That's highly intelligible. Of course, there might be more than one, but if you discover this, we reclassify. And we've got lots of examples, just as we reclassify the species. If we find out that we've wrongly lumped a whole lot together, a cryptic species, we reclassify into the into two species. And that's all confirmed the hypothesis that actually the, uh, uh, the taxon, the taxon thought to be a race, has some underlying nature. We could be wrong, as I said, about any one of these, but we're not wrong about the sections. That's my line. And I'll be happy to explain it if you want. So now we turn to humans, of course, which is where all the excitement is. Um, and I'm going to do a bit of skipping here, but the short, um, short point is in the opening sentence just the same sorts of differences motivate distinctions that have often been made among. And then I have various staff in the literature which talk about. Let's go over to page three. I can skip a lot of that stuff. To get uh, something that's important to emphasize, and which of course you will with all be anxious to point out, the differences between alleged human races, which these taxa are supposed to to explain are not nearly as significant as the sad history of racism predicted. That is, in the sad history of racism, 
they, people distinguish race. And by the way, historically, they distinguish race on pretty much the sort of assumptions that I've just been talking about. That is, assuming different histories, assuming different underlying. What we found quite of course in history is that people proposed quite radical differences between races. Attending to properties that are so important to us as humans. Well, all of that has turned out no basis at all. But it's nonetheless, there are differences which race isn't the way. The first of them are familiar and obvious differences. And as, as the philosopher of biology Hardiman points out, they're intrinsically interested to biologists, just as the difference between the two sorts of snakes is intrinsically interested, and they distinguish the pattern. And then there's the whole issue of medical science. Now, this is a little bit complicated, and I'm just giving you my summing up of quite a long discussion. Medical science shows a lot more interest explanatory role for the races. I quote from Root, who is actually someone who's skeptical of the role of uh, race in medical science. Rates of morbidity and mortality, sickle cell anemia, major infectious diseases, many cancers, diabetes, asthma, strokes, heart failure, tuberculosis, EDI, HIV, AIDS, and more. Racial differences play a role. Now, one should not assume that these are actually explained by the taxon differences I, I identified. Some of them are actually, we already know, explained by social features. So it could be the differences that the role that race is playing in medical science can part, can, quite often at least, be certainly uh, attributed to the social effects of people being in certain not to anything intrinsic and reflecting different history. However, some are sickle cell anemia is one. That is, there is this is it's in the nature. And we could go into the details here, but I, I haven't got time. So let's pause, think, stand back for a minute on this tax. One might, of course, accept realism about taxa in general without accepting it for humans. But that's a hard decision to make, maintain. The story about humans, which I've very briefly summarized, is very similar to ones told for many other species. Now what I go on to say, I use the same language that we find in the biological literature discussing race in, in non humans. The differences between alleged humans seem to be just the sort of fairly minor differences between members of a species that have, as noted, prompted biologists to posit the sorts of interests to be taxing that biologists often call races. The differences are few and subtle. The populations are genetically distinct, geographically distinct, and so on. Biology should treat humans as like other species. What then could be the basis for resisting racial realism to humans? Well, there are quite a few objections, <laughs> which I'm not going to be going through, but they're all listed there. But I do want to emphasize something, something in, in my response to, to the second objection. Oh no, comment on the first objection. This is a quote from Kaplan, a lead of an influential biologist. Quote, that some populations that we call races do differ in allele frequencies and hence our biological races as well as social races is not much in doubt. You get the worry in the philosophy of race you get to worry that um, if you start accepting that there are these differences, the differences in uh, 
groups motivate the scenery to them as different taxa, explain biological taxa, and calling them race, you get the objection, oh, can you see, please, would you kind of start doing that it's on the basis of the sort of minor difference? Where does it end? There are lots of minor differences which we could, we could other, why don't we pick on these minor differences? Group those, group those together and tax on some. Well, uh, I have a, quite a lengthy response, but I want to just give you my concluding remark. Any kind, this is at the bottom of page three, any kind at any intra-specific level is worth adverting to in our theory if it has sufficient explanatory power. There's no reason to be miserly here. Races are sufficiently races are sufficiently explanatory. Races are sufficiently explanatory kinds at a somewhat vaguely identified intra-specific level. They're not partial races. Okay, so that's and I'm going to skip to all this. I'm going to skip all the rest of these objections that I'm talking about in this time. All of that is really just about what taxa is appropriate to at the interest specific level. Is it appropriate to have these interest specific taxa? Uh, are they explanatory? And I'm saying yes, yeah, well, 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 and some of them are called racist. That, of course, doesn't settle their rightly called racist. That's the category. And that's what I want to move to now. I think the most, um, I've skipped the arguments against tax on tourism, but I don't think those arguments are very persuasive. I think the most persuasive arguments against race realism are at the category level, which is what I'm now going to get to. Section 6.6, .6, race, category, realism. Now, of course, if race tax on realism, racial tax on realism were false, uh, then the, the whole category issue would arise. But I've just argued it's good. the tax on issue is true. Uh, so that means that uh, we have a genuine interest in whether the category issue. Category is true. I want to say that it is true. Uh, I consider two sorts of considerations on this. Um, the first one is the wording of the name issue. Uh, and I've got some quotes there, and I've got others in the Chapter. By the way, if anyone wants to read the draft of all this, uh, I'll manage to read it well. And it's, I hope to be published very soon. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, concern about it. does this, does the biologically significant taxa fit a folk concept of race? I take a very I'm very good at that uh, over quite a lot of pages. And this is where this, so there's, I mean, quite, quite up front, people claim to be doing semantics. Semantics is too hard, even for the people who do it for a living. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a hand. Uh, and it's a terrific mistake, I argue, to draw any biological conclusion from whatever, from your armchair, you can figure out on the semantics. Because from your armchair, you could probably figure out very little if you have any reason to believe it, because it's just too hard. Um, so I'm, it goes on and on, I'm almost a page of the handout, and I think I'm just going to skip right over it. Because I think I'm going to get to what I think is the really interesting issue, the most interesting issue altogether that's raised by race reason, and that's the explanatory issue here, because it has a it has an impact. Ramifications way beyond the race debate in the philosophy of biology. So here, let's get 
very beginning of it gives an indication of how it has implications possible. So let me just remind you of what we're here discussing. The thesis. The thesis is race category views. There are intraspecific kinds that form a biological the explanatory category race. The, 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 being a race is an interest, is a theoretically explanatory kind of kind. Right? That's, that's what's the issue. So we're not arguing here about Pacific Islanders and Amerindians and so on. And though they're, a, they're taxa, like dogs and dingoes and things like that. They're all taxa. And I've already said what I've got, got to say about that. Now we're arguing about whether any of these taxa are explanatory, whether they're, they're all an explanatory interest in China. Okay. So I want to start here, if this is in 6.62 on page five, with species. And there's a quote from, there's a say, I have a, a bit of a discussion of uh, uh, Mark Ereshevsky's view. Uh, Mark is a leading philosopher of biology, and he says, as I quote, species category does not exist. What's going on there? He is denying, this is my general line, which you already have, the explanatory, signif the explanatory significance of kinds being species. That's what banishing is. Now, moment of attention. Why is Mark doing this? Well, as you may all know, in biology, there is a there is an enormous amount of attention to the issue: what is it to be a species? And this is answered by what I unhappily call species concepts. Species concepts are actually theories of what it is. To be a species. The most famous, perhaps, is my, uh, Ernst Meyer's biological species concept. Ernst Meyer uh, says that to be a species is to be a population. Well, there are various versions of this, but this is the is to be a population, an integrated population that is reproductively isolated from other populations. But there are many species concepts. Depending on who's counting, you get somewhere between 20 and 30 in the group. And blood flows in the gutters as to which of these is right. So all of these are, you might say, robust theories of what it is to be a species. And Mark and some others come think, in, as I construe them, that being a species is not an explanatory concept in biology because they think there is not just one true species concept. They think there's a kitchen, by the way, another one, very famous philosopher of biology. There's not just one biological, uh, so there's not just one true species concept, there are several. Mark thinks that there's three, kitchen, quite a few more. Mark thinks there are, I won't go into details here, but I have eco species, phyllo species, and uh, one second, hold on. Bio, eco species, bio species, bio species. So, what he's saying is, these are explanatory significant kinds of kinds. The species is just a horrible disjunction of a whole lot of things. It's not, it's not explanatory. Very interesting institution. Uh, and it, I must say, I, I, I'm a bit inclined to think it's true, actually, but I'm not. Because, but the important thing to see is his rejection of reality the species concept is a rejection of it not having one true species concept. Most people think it does have one true 
concept, and that's where the blood flows in the arms. Okay. Now, moves the other linear categories, the higher categories, they call it. Well, as I say, on the whereas rejecting the species categories, not, not, one, not the ones they call just about everyone rejects the higher categories. They will say things like they're not real or they don't exist. Unhappy terminology, as I've already said, but what they're getting at, in my view, is the, the, the higher categories. What are we talking about here? Well, I won't go right up on this, but above species, we've got genus. Above genus, we've got family. Above family, we've got order, and so on. These Linnaean categories are pretty well rejected by in the business. My way of summing up why they're rejected is they don't have a concept. That was a that the species of that meant as concepts. A, a robust answer to the question in virtual body science species. There is not a robust answer to the question in virtual body science genus or a family. So they all reject it. Not all, but people want to reject it. Before we go much further, I've got to, uh, it is important to see that what these biologists and philosophers are doing in rejecting the Linnaean hierarchy, they're not rejecting the, the sorry, the Linnaean categories or hierarchy categories. They're not rejecting the hierarchy. It's still everyone says. The Canidae includes Canis, which includes Canis familiaris. So the issue, all of that, as I say, is nothing to do with race, is it? But now we turn to race. But with it in mind, the issue for, for race, the category race, is, is it explanatory? And a positive answer to that requires much more then problematically identifying race with subspecies or with ecospecies. I mentioned early on that quite a lot of people do that because subspecies and ecospecies are, up, <laughs> are open to just the same doubts that we were airing a few minutes ago about um, genus and so on. What we need to support the view that the category is real is we need a robust, we need a, a species concept, sorry, a race concept analogous to a species concept, and analogous to what we don't have for genus, family, and so on. We need a theory of what it is to be a race. We're on to page six. Well, there have been several attempts, which I summarize in the chapter, a lot of great interest. I don't have much faith in these attempts, and they've got pretty, uh, they, they tend to get rubbish by people. It's not working, and mostly I think they get rubbish for good reason. Um, uh, there's an influential one, the tape was five stuff, but I'm going to pass over that. So I, I'm going to, I suppose in my chapter, I'll suppose these things. Let's suppose that. The critics are right, and there isn't a nice, robust race concept that would sustain realism. How concerned should we be? Well, the really important thing to notice here is that this puts the category race in the same boat as the category genus and all the other cat higher categories. And even the much loved species, remember, there's the disputes, but you know, remember there are the, the Arashevskys and Kitchens of this world who even think it isn't a category, a real category. So, so that's a sort of, if you want to be a race realist, that's a sort of complex, isn't it? Race as a category is, seems to be in the same boat as genesis as a category. Now, standing back from not just the category race, the category issue in general, and all this skepticism 
higher ones in race gap. We should note some. I see biologists are very skeptical of these categories of the nanos, yet they keep using them all the time. They're talking about genus and family. Just look at any biological discussion. So this is a sort of a little bit disconcerting. Um, Strolling and Griffith, my mates um, in their lovely uh, textbook sex and death, confront this issue and they say, what is the make of the fact that everyone keeps talking about what according to them doesn't exist? <laughs> and, and they say, uh, no, I can't find it on my hand now. Uh, oh, yes, here we are. Quote, the importance of the information expressed is that's why they keep the importance of the information. How could they have it have important information if it's not, as it were, supported by a robust concept? I think they're on the right lines here. Um, so I think what lies behind that, the truth behind that uh, remark of uh, strong River is a minimal, not a robust concept, but a minimal concept. Uh, and this is, oh God, I'm going to move along. I'm going to finish over a few minutes. But at this point, I want to give you the text, if I can find it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, of course, this is tricky. So I now want to introduce um, a minimal concept. Initially, not for us. But for the Linnaean categories. First, we start by noting that the categories are kinds of biological types at various levels in the hierarchy of taxa. There's a hierarchy of taxa, so no one denies that. That is, heinous includes dogs and wolves and so on. No one denies that. And the categories are kinds of biological taxa at various levels of the hierarchy. These taxa, the taxa, have explanatory, intrinsic historical matrix and essences of the sort I've discussed. Taxa at one level of the hierarchy are contained in taxa at higher levels. And consider the, consider the taxon, consider the category genus. To say that a taxon is a genus is to say that it is a taxon of a kind that is in the next explanatory level above the category species, but below the category family. I've mentioned the snakes, my California snakes. Well, think of them. Okay. One explan along one explanatory dimension, I thought I've distinguished the explanatory, different explanatory dimensions, quite intuitive stuff which will emerge here. Right? In one, one explanatory dimension, being in the species, Thamnophis certalis, that's the species for these California snakes, clearly explains the species, being in that species, clearly explains more of the phenotypic properties of its members than does being in the genus. Thamnophis. But on another dimension, being a member of that genus explains some phenotypic properties of more organisms than does that being in that species, because it explains these properties not only of the members of that species, but also of all the other species in the genus. In other words, where the level that the that kind is at in the hierarchy of kinds has consequences for its planetary power. And something that's deemed a species has different explanatory powers from something deemed the genus. Sort of reading. It's an indication. So I go indication power. Moving up the hierarchy, 
we get a similar comparison between the explanatory powers of the taxa classified as a family and ones classified as a genus, and so on up. The place of a taxon in the hierarchy of taxa is an indication of its explanatory power along the two dimensions. The criticism of the Linnaean categories shows that those categories are imperfect guides to the place of a taxon in the hierarchy. But nonetheless, they do provide some information of that. skip a bit. So despite the imperfections of the Linnaean categories, they are at least explanatory in this somewhat minimal way of marking out in a rough and ready way a level in the hierarchy of explanatory taxa. The categories are not as explanatorily important as the taxa they, they categorize. I think that's important to see. But they are indeed informative. As Strohm and Griffith noted. The boat that the Linnaean categories are in is not totally unseaworthy, even though we lack robust concepts for these hierarchies. Return now to the category race, just two more points on the To say that a taxon is a biological race is to say that it is a kind of biological taxon that is at an explanatory level below species. What level? Well, I've noted that like other names for intraspecific categories, race is used informally and a bit loosely in biology. As a result, race is identified sometimes with subspecies, which is at the first intraspecific level, sometimes with ecotype or form, which is at the lower level. So the category is undesirably vague and internal. There's no fact of the matter which Intraspecific level is the taxon, is, uh, is, is the taxon of race, is race. Still, I emphasize that it is explanatory to know that a taxon is a race, even with the indeterminacy. Let me give you an example. Consider the Pacific Islander. The claim that they are a race tells us that being a Pacific Islander explains more of the primitive properties of its members than does being in the species Homo sapiens. But being a member of that species, I was happening, explains some, explains some primitive properties of more organisms than does being in that race. Because it explains the properties not only of members of that race, but also of all the other races and species. So even if it's right that race is not robustly explanatory, it is at least explanatory in this somewhat minimal way of marking out too vaguely a level in the intraspecific hierarchy of taxa. Race is not as explanatory important as taxa like Pacific Islanders, but it is thought to categorize, but it is not unimportant. So, this minimal racial category realism puts race in the same boat as the Linnaean categories. And as noted, that boat is not totally unseaworthy. Summing up, and I'll stop. Sorry to run so long. So, I'm suggesting. That racial realism may have to settle for minimal racial category realism. How disappointing should that be? First, the lack of a robust race concept. Let me remind you a concept here, I think always the model of the species. The concept would tell you what it is for a kind in a robust way, what it is for a kind to be. First, the lack of a robust speech concept is clearly disappointing. Still, I suggest it should be only mildly disappointing. After all, we lack a robust concept for Janus and the other higher categories, but still find it useful to talk about, it, as indeed we should, given the minimal concept. Of course, given the indeterminacy of race, it marks out an explanatory level in an even more rough and ready way than does Janus, but it still is explanatory. Second, even the minimal concept addresses the, the findings of grain worry. Oh, I didn't mention the Kenyans. Uh, John Dupre has a, a nice example. Uh, strangely, John, who is so against racial, racial realism, is quite 
enthusiastic about what he calls local ecotypes. Um, what I would call, I think biologists too might call strains. Uh, and he has a, the nice example of Kenyans. See, Kenyans, as anyone who's interested in sport would have noticed, are astonishingly good distance runners, winning marathons and so on. How, why is this? Well, everyone who follows sport was heard. They live at a high altitude and they have a running culture. Now, it's quite likely, and I think, if I remember right, John is speculating, that this, they may have actually evolved as a result of this. That is, they may have adapted to this and they may actually, their, 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 their underlying their essence, their history and nature is now different from other members of the, of the uh, African black uh, race. So they are, uh, they are not a race themselves, they are a strain of the race. Race is marked out at an inflammatory level and even more rough and ready range. It is still explanatory. Second, even the minimal concept addresses the fineness of grain. Thus, to suppose that Kenyans are a strain of the African race is to put Kenyans in a more fine grained category than Africans, and Africans in a more fine grained category than their species, human. And this position in the categories is explanatory significant, as we have demonstrated even if not as explanatory significant as one might have hoped. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. And now, yeah, if anyone in the chat ha has a question, please type Q or write down your question in the chat because I'm not sure that I can hear you. And then Michael will address them. And otherwise, we move to the audience. Um, this is 